So, in honor of number three, which is our last primarily uh, historical note, Russia and the Jews. So, we're so familiar with Russian Jews, and most American Jews are descended from Russian Jews. The largest, largest group of Jewish immigrants to come to this country after the DT camps emptied out. In the, starting in the early 70s with Russian Jews. So we think of Russia and Jews as one. In other words, but the truth is, unlike Germany or France or Iraq, which have had Jews for a very long time, uh, the Tsars, from the time that the, that the Muscovite dynasty pushed the, the, um, the Mongols out, they were very, very strict about not letting Jews in. Even Jewish merchants who had come to trade um, in uh, Russia were, were habitually executed. What happened was, though, that uh, after the Kalamanitsky rebellion and the in, in the Ukraine and the terrible massacres that accompanied it, Ukraine descended into chaos which seems to be a historically repetitive kind of uh, activity. And, uh, and in the end, Russia got fed up with the chaos and made a deal with Poland, in which Poland got the western half of Ukraine, and Russia got the eastern half of Ukraine, which is what's driving, by the way, the present unpleasantness, is the fact that the Russians historically, they say, look, we're willing to accept the existence of Poland, and even Western Ukraine, but Eastern Ukraine is ours. And a lot of people who live in Eastern Ukraine seem to think that way. One of the amusing things about this is that I was talking about it uh, with the members of my, uh, of my Thursday night class who were here, that, that each side was accusing the other of being anti-Semitic, and each side was, was saying that they're coming in to protect the Jews against the anti-Semites on the other side. So for a moment in history, we have Ukrainians and Russians fighting over who loves the Jews more. And if that's not the sign that the approach of Mashiach, I don't know what is. But at any rate, in 1667, Russia got its first bunch of Jews and didn't really know what to do with them. Then in 1772, at the first partition of Poland, um, some of you have probably crossed the Kostkusho Bridge on the, uh, on, the, on the 87. That's named after a Polish patriot who left uh, Poland with a price on his head for rebelling against the Russian occupation and being an unemployed military fellow he found work with George Washington and was perhaps even more important than, uh, than Lafayette in actually training the American troops. At any rate, so out of the, out of the co-option of the Jews by Russia emerged uh, one of the factors that made this country succeed, and of course much later it becomes a refuge for Jews for Russia. So history is fascinating that way. But at any rate, in 1772 they got a whole bunch of Jews, and not long after that they instituted the Pale of Settlement because they realized that highly skilled and ambitious Jews would overrun Russia. And it's only after the Russian Revolution uh, that Jews were freely allowed, at least potentially, to live in all the big cities. Though most of the, though there were a lot of Jews already in St. Petersburg and Moscow, are living there illegally. There, this is the, this gives rise to one of the very famous uh, Russian Jewish jokes, which incidentally also coincides with the rise of a fitness and diet craze among the aristocracy in the 1880s. So we can place it because no one thought about such things until the 1880s. When, when, when uh, these various sanitariums emerged all across <coughs> Europe, providing diet and exercise to fat aristocrats. At any rate, uh, the story goes as follows: that you have two. So you needed a special passport in Russia. You needed an internal passport. You need a special passport stamped that this Jew is allowed to live in St. Petersburg. So two Jews are walking along. One has a passport. One doesn't. And they see a policeman approaching. So the Jew with the passport says, I have an idea. He tells the Jew without the passport, you stay here. And he, he takes off running at the, at, the top, at the top speed. So of course the policeman seeing a Jew running assumes that he's the one without the passport and starts chasing him. After a long chase, he lets him catch him. 
And huffing and puffing, the policeman demands to see his passport. He produces a perfectly good passport. So he says, so why were you running? He says, oh, my doctor told me I have to run every morning for my health. So he says, but you saw me chasing you. Why didn't you stop? He says, I thought your doctor told you the same thing. <laughs> Which is a quintessential Russian Jewish joke. Um, but it, it, it speaks of the experience. Later, at the very end, the last two pieces are from a mystical text that emerges from this uh, quasi-Russian Jewish community, this pale sentiment settlement community. But for now, uh, so in reality, the Jews, Jews actually exist in Russia by, only by, uh, by the fact that they annexed Poland. And once again, if you look at the ironies of history, um, Russia, Russia annexed the Jews of Poland, uh, persecuted them greatly, uh, thereby, uh, thereby pushing a lot of them out at the end of the 19th century to the United States which of course was, as they say, good for the Jews. And also, uh, in, uh, it also, the Tsars laid the seeds for their own demise by swallowing up so many Jews, they ended up with, uh, with various people, uh, various people uh, like Trotsky and his like, who uh, as much as we might not admire their politics, uh, certainly did a very good job at overthrowing the Tsarist government. You know, as they used to say, as American Jews used to say in the 1920s during the Red Scare, it's true that many communists are Jews, but most Jews are not communists. But uh, certainly they laid the seeds for their own, own, own demise um, at that regard. Indeed, the Reb Shmuel, the fourth Lubavitcher Rebbe, who was very active in St. Petersburg, he had the largest Russian Hasidic community, uh, remarked to one of the Tsar's ministers, he says, look, because after the first pogroms in 1881-1882, he says, listen, he says, if you, keep, if you keep proceeding with these pogroms, you're going to unleash forces that are completely remove your rulership from the table. And as we know, they didn't listen. So, bye. <laughs> <laughs> Since a lot of these bears are American, and in particular one of them based on the description is part of this very American process of taking things from the old world and the new world and mixing and matching them. Um, I thought to take the moment, you don't have a text on it, of the new world of Jewish thought. And we don't have any turkey tonight because we're eating milk eggs. Tomatoes are, of course, from the new world. They are related to nightshade, which is a poisonous plant, that's the red plants. But tomatoes and eggplants are actually not poisonous, so I wouldn't advise you to eat the, uh, to eat the stems and the like. Um, and tomatoes, of course, are one of the great contributions of the Americas to the world cuisine. Uh, and furthermore, what's interesting is that the New World created some interesting questions. Among them, uh, the Mexican turkey was uh, taken to Europe, bred, uh, bred for a while, and became what we call today the domesticated turkey. And the question became, is this bird kosher? So there are, with kosher birds, there are essentially three opinions, each shared by several major authorities. One is that you have to have an absolute tradition for each bird. The other is that there's a list of there is a list of characteristics of a kosher bird. And a kosher bird that nails all of them may be consumed. The third opinion says that if you have a bird that shares the same kosher signs as a bird we have a tradition of, because there are different, you don't need all of them to make a bird kosher, and in general seems to be organized the same biologically, so then it's permitted. So the turkey, uh, is biologically similar to the chicken, uh, which has a kosher tradition, though there are several families in Jerusalem who insist that the modern chicken, which was bred from uh, Southeast Asian, Indo-Chinese birds, uh, together with the European chicken, like the leg uh, egg-laying chicken, uh, is not kosher. Uh, but this is this is literally three families in Mayashara. <laughs> uh, which is but they're not the same three families that visit Iran regularly, just 
for the record. Um, but with turkeys, it was more controversial until this opinion that if it has the same kosher characteristics and they look the same, because basically a turkey is very similar in its in its in its gizzard and its crop and its toes and so on to a chicken, it was declared kosher. The great mystic, Rabbi Shaya Horowitz, though he didn't write about this, asked his descendants not to eat turkey because of this question. So you will meet till this day people named Horowitz or Gurevich who do not eat, which is the Russian form of the name, who do not eat um, turkey. Um, uh, of course, uh, the, the famous Russian com Soviet company that produced, uh, that produced the antagonist aircraft uh, to the uh, to the free world. The MIG company is a company made by two fellows named Mikhail and Gurevich. It's unclear whether Gurevich kept his father's, his great grandfather's dictum about not eating turkey. I don't know how religious he probably was. <laughs> but his name was Gurevich and he was a descendant, therefore, of the Holy Shalom. Um, there's a, a good story about that, that actually it was, it was Mikhail or Gurevich who met uh, one of the designers out of Lockheed, you know, designed the SR-71 and other such famous aircraft uh, at the Paris Air Show, which is where everyone came to show that, you know, they had bigger, to better toys than the other. And uh, he cornered uh, one of the Lockheed designers and told him, he says, you know what the difference between Russian aircraft and American aircraft is? He says, the American plane is like a fine Swiss watch. It works fantastic, but you drop it, it it's going to be a week in the, the watchmakers. He says, Russian plane is like Missy, Mickey Mouse watch. It breaks, you pick it up and shake it, and it starts working. <laughs> uh, anyways, that, apparently that was Gurevich who said. So, uh, but going back to the, coming back to the question of the New World uh, and the turkeys, uh, what's quite interesting is that in... Jewish mystical writing and also um, uh, astronomical writing, the New World is referred to as Chatsi Kador Hatachto, the lower, the lower half of the globe. When we're used to looking at globes from the North Pole, the United States and South America and so on are not the lower part of the globe. But in Jewish thinking, and this relates, by the way, to the international date line, that the Jewish date line is somewhere near the international date line, the globe is seen as revolved and that Yerushalayim is the very top of the globe. Yerushalayim is the top of the globe. So the upper half of the globe is the 108, the 90 degrees on all sides of Jerusalem. And the lower half of the globe, so if you do go 90 degrees from Jerusalem on each direction, you'll see that the Atlantic and the Pacific pretty much begin there. And so the New World, including Australia, belongs to the lower half of the globe if Israel is on the top, if you rotate the globe that way. And the idea is, is that the reason why this was said when America was, was discovered, or at least uh, uh, discovered uh, by the Europeans, one presumes the Native Americans knew it existed already. Um, but uh, one of the interesting things is, is that the, the reason why, historically, there were no Jews or Jewish communities in this part of the world, so actually was that some of the Italian Kabbalists who were familiar with geography, astronomy, and the latest discoveries, uh, cartography, etc., they made the point that the Torah was given in the upper half of the world. In other words, if you look at the day the Torah was given, it was day in much of the old world, and night in the new world. So as if it were, the New World did not experience that day of giving of the Torah, so it would be a more difficult place for Judaism to take root. And indeed it was difficult. It uh, didn't really, you know, a really, how do I put it, vibrant and learned Jewish community didn't really take root in this country until after the Second World War, but it did. So this concept, the, the, this concept uh, was sort of turned on its head where, where basically the idea was is that the true, when... Um, when some of the, many of the great uh, Hasidic uh, rabbis came to this country, uh, among them, uh, among them, Yosef uh, Yitzchok, the previous Lubavitcher rabbi, made the remark that in principle America is no different because the whole point of the Torah is that it illuminates the darkness. So even 
the place where the Torah was not, that was at dark when the Torah was given, is also transformable. And, uh, and that, was, uh, that was the idea. But for a long time, there was this premise that Judaism would have a hard time flourishing in, in the Americas, in, Australia, in Australasia, and so on and so forth. Uh, though, of course, over time that changed, just as the attitude of Jews to eating turkey. One could not, of course, imagine Israel today without Turkey, right? So, and many important Israeli dishes, such as shawarma and the like, come from Turkey, right? As a matter of a fact, um, matter of fact, my my uh, my my wife, his family, some came from Russia to Israel, some came from Russia to the United States. The Israeli branch, several of them. Uh, got their start in Israel raising turkeys. Um, when Kfar Chabad was just a few families and a few caravans and lots of empty space, there were turkeys running all over the place. So, okay. So let's have the fourth beer. So now, we're up to uh, Germany and Jewish mysticism. So there's a piece here, there's a short, very short bio of Rebu the Achasid and the Baal Shem of Worms who represent a certain art in Jewish mysticism. So a little bit of background. Traditionally, once we get past the very early years of the Kabbalah, the Jewish mystical tradition as expressed in the Zohar, which is in the land of Israel in the second century, most of the people we hear about are in Israel, uh, Mesopotamia, and subsequently in the Sephardic world. But there was a tremendous a tremendous mystical tradition, a tremendous Kabbalistic tradition that made its way through German and French Jewry. And this is a small group of people, but a very important group, who preserved a lot of the earlier, from the period of the, of before the destruction of the temple, after the destruction of the temple, a lot of the, um, of the, what I, what I, what I call the, uh, the um, the meditative Kabbalah, things like the the originally some of the earliest Kabbalistic texts talk about journeying through various worlds and various uh, spiritual spaces. There's no description. The assumption being, if you're reading this, you're already on a level where you're experiencing it, and you just need some guidance. And because of that assumption, the circle was extraordinarily small. Reb Shmuel, uh, who was called by some Reb Shmuel Hanavi, Shmuel the seer, he was seen as someone with some degree of prophecy, and his son Reb Yehuda Hasid, and others uh, represented this family uh, who were descended from the first Klonimus. Klonimus is a common German Jewish name, it's a Latin name, but this Klonimus family uh, were the prime teachers of Kabbalah in Germany. Subsequently, uh, many of the, uh, so a after the many expulsions from Germany, this school was disseminated um, throughout Poland and Bohemia. And when things eased and the Jewish, the German community, the Jewish community began to grow again, uh, many of those came back. So Rabbi Leo Baal Shem of Worms, um, Rabbi Leo Loans, was. Uh, was someone who had received the teachings of the Ari and combined it with the teachings of the righteous ones of Ashkenaz, the Hasidei Ashkenaz, uh, to create a particular understanding of Kabbalah. And that understanding actually fed in um, to the later Hasidim. In other words, the Hasidism founded by the Baal Shem Tov, who were very influenced by Rebbe Leo of Baal Shem. And uh, for part of that reason, uh, the expression of Kabbalistic ideas into practical behavior, in particular into prayer, was extremely important because this is something that was very important to the Hasidic Ashkenaz. So there is a connection between the Hasidim of Germany and the later Hasidim who we know much better. One of the interesting asides to this is that as we know, uh, this synagogue, for example, Davin's what's called Nusach Sfard, it's actually an Ashkenazic uh, write uh, liturgy with various uh, changes based on the Hasidic adoption of Rabbi Yitzchak Luria Ari, the great Kabbalist of teachings. 
and the as we know, the Rebilio of Vilna, the Vilna God, was extremely opposed to many of the innovations of Hasidism, though he himself was a student, considered himself a student of the Ari. Indeed, some of the deepest debates that he had with Hasidism had to do with deferring interpretations of the Ari's teachings. But the Vilna God made it a very interesting point. He says that the adoption of the Hasidic, of the Lurianic liturgy, that we have today in this synagogue, the Nusach Svar, is based on various Kabbalistic meditations that were built around the Svar Siddur because the people who preceded the Ari, in other words, they were all Svardic or Italian, either from Spain or from Italy, and the Italian Nusach was very similar to the Svardic Nusach. He says there's no doubt that the Hasidi Ashkenaz had their own med Kabbalistic meditations that fit the Ashkenaz liturgy, but that have been lost. So his argument was that the that it's not so much not so much that the Sephardic liturgy is more friendly to uh, Kabbalistic teachings, but merely that they had been attached to it, which of course uh, was one of the debates as to whether the teachings had been attached or whether the Nusach Ari, in other words, the Sephardicized uh, Nusach of those uh, liturgy of those who followed the Kabbalah, was actually. Uh, was actually uh, more in line with the teachings of the Kabbalah. The, the very interesting aside of that is, is that, um, is that uh, someone we're going to meet later tonight, of Shnei Zalman of Liadi, who authored the Tanya, was one of the students of the Magid, one of the Rebbe's of the third generation of Hasidism, uh, made the argument that the, that the Nusach Ari was not simply an adaption of the Sfard Nusach, but actually uh, he had this idea that, there, that, that in the temple there were 12 gates. In the first temple there were 12 gates, which each tribe entered through, and there was a 13th gate that only the, uh, that only, that everyone could enter through. So he says that in the heavenly temple, there's all because the prayer takes the place of the temple service, there's a gate for each tribe, but there's also a general <coughs> gate, so if you don't know which tribe you belong to, you go through that gate. So he said that all the various liturgies, they're all equally holy and equally valid, and they all belong to people who have their roots in, in one or another tribe, spiritually. But if you don't know where your spiritual roots are, which means either you can't see them because you're not such a Kabbalist, or you don't know which tribe you belong to, and we don't even know which Nusach goes to which tribe, you're better off with the general gate. But at any rate, this debate as to whether the Ari's liturgy was a general gate or merely an adaption lay, lay at the root of the more serious debate that surrounded the foundings of Hasidism uh, and goes back to the fact that uh, though we often look at German Jews as extremely, as extremely, shall we say, by the book, halachic, non-mystical types in truth, uh, the, the, German, the German Jewry represents uh, an important, not just an important element, but the very early Kabbalah, um, the Kabbalah of the Heicholos and the Merkavos and so on, would not have come down to us. In other words, the Kabbalah that goes all the way back to the Second Temple period would not have come down to us because it was specifically preserved <laughs> by the Hasidic Ashkenaz, by the righteous ones of Ashkenaz. Okay. I think we can move on to, I guess, what, to their number five. Number yeah. six will be very short. Next will be a bit longer. Since some of the uh, bears are British, there's a lot of written on the Jews. So I thought to tell the story. Now, interestingly enough, there is uh, um, there there have not been a lot of mystics among British Jews, it shouldn't surprise you. Um, though there was a Baal Shem of London, uh, who may have been a bit of a charlatan. Um, and then uh, there was uh, there was uh, Lord Gordon, who first was involved in leading riots against, uh, against uh, recognizing Catholicism in Ireland, landed in jail, decided to convert to Judaism, uh, underwent a bris and everything, and uh, and uh, apparently was very drawn uh, by the study of uh, Kabbalah. 
Um, he was when quite, was he? he was early 19th century. He was a very interesting fellow, quite eccentric, but that was sort of a tradition among the British aristocracy. And it was not his eccentricity that bothered people, it was his Judaism. But he was very supportive, actually, of the Jewish community and the small Jewish community in Israel at the time. But at any rate, what I wanted to mention was, uh, my note here says they kicked the Jews out in 1290, got them back under Carmel at the end of 1655. There were always crypto-Jews living in England. Um, they just didn't declare themselves Jewish. But after 1655, December 1655, they began forming communities and synagogues. And as we know, uh, King John kicked them out in 1290. And their return was, was done in a very British fashion. Uh, Oliver Cromwell, the Lord Protector between the British kings, uh, he invited a group of lawyers and, uh, and uh, royal historians and the like, or British historians, uh, to discuss the question. And it emerged that there was no actual, actual law expelling the Jews from Spain, the Jews being the king's property at the time, had been expelled on the king's whim. So they came to the conclusion that since there's no actual law expelling the Jews from Spain, whoops, it was all a little mistake, and Jews were never not allowed to England. Jews were never not allowed in Britain. It was just a, 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 mere, a mere error for them to assume all these years that they weren't allowed because there's no actual law that says they can't come in. So by doing that, he avoided the whole public debate on the matter, and Jews returned to, to, return to England uh, based on the legal premise that they never actually were expelled, which is very British if you think about it. Okay, so that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's my bit for Britain. And then we will, in the next few pieces, we'll address the actual, uh, an actual ingredient of beer and what it symbolizes in, uh, in Jewish mysticism. Okay.